Well, thanks for the organizers to invite me to give this talk. Um, and I'm going to talk a little bit about the dwarf galaxies and the small galaxies in general and how they collapse can tell us a little bit about the primordial magnetic fields. Um, so I'll just start by showing this. And well, give, given the title of my talk, you might say, oh, I know what it should be. <laughs> but, uh, but this is actually what we are trying to look at and learn about magnetic fields. So this is, um, believe it or not, a galaxy. And uh, here are the stars in that galaxy. So if I go back, uh, let's see. So definitely the foreground stars, you don't care about them. But these stars, these dots, color coded by the color means that their association with the galaxy. This is, called, this is called an ultra faint dwarf for uh, obvious reasons. And uh, we, uh, we have about like now 20 of them in the Milky Way, as in Milky Way satellites, hard to discover. And uh, this is basically the galaxy I was showing you. This is Reticulum 2, a very peculiar one. And these ultra faint dwarf galaxies are dead system. They are not chemically evolved. Um, Satellites, least luminous, like their solar mass range from like 10 to the 3 solar mass to 10 to the 5 solar mass. So really like a thousand solar mass of star is their whole budget. And the idea is, uh, well, they have collapsed at high redshifts. And uh, what could have prevented them to collapse is magnetic fields. And let's uh, look at their star formation. So, Actually, we only have like <laughs> deep uh, star formation history uh, for only six of these uh, ultra faint dwarfs. And here I'm showing, this is a plot from Brown et al, who has studied six of these objects in, with HSD. And this is cumulative star formation history. And the idea that you get from studying them is that more than 75% of their stellar budget has been assembled above redshift of 12 or 13. And uh, well, this is, this is very interesting. That means that these galaxies have already been collapsed prior to that redshift. And uh, let's, uh, and then there are different ways to study these objects. So one way is to actually go to a high resolution and body simulation. Um, in this case, we have analyzed a caterpillar suit of simulations. This is an MIT group that have done a high resolution and body simulation uh, with 10 to the four solar mass in particle mass so that they can resolve actually the halos. Uh, of these, uh, these objects that at the end they can find at redshift zero in their simulations. These are Milky Way zoom simulations. And then there are different ways. So you go and select ultra faint dwarf candidate halos, like sub halos in the Milky Way zoom simulation. And you trace them back. The identification, there are four, we chose four different techniques to identify them. And then you kind of trace them back all the way to redshift uh, around reorganization, and you plot their mass distribution. And this is what, for example, what you get if you assume that these objects have been dead at redshift of eight. Roughly, their mass distribution should be between 10 to the 6.5 to uh, barely passing the atomic cooling limit. So then this is universal, I mean, uh, there's, there's a scatter about like what, exactly what different method you choose. I don't want to go through the details of these four techniques. But the idea is that uh, where the mass peaks is around 10 to the 8, 10 to the 7, redshift 8. And then uh, you can follow this further and to higher and higher redshift. So in this plot, I only want you to look at the lower left panel, which, where I show like for one of these techniques, if you choose one of them and you trace them to redshifts above eight, like 10, 12, 
uh, and how does the mass distribution change? As you can see, of course, they're gonna just, the histogram is gonna shift towards lower and lower masses. Um, so you have two data. You, one is that these objects have already formed the stars at redshift 13. And you know the mass distribution, the, what is the halo mass of these objects. So you know that they have been collapsed, and uh, all you need to do is to write two formulas to say uh, what is the magnetic field of strength when they were collapsing. So you just write down the uh, uh, baryonic uh, overdensity evolution. So there is a Hubble term, that, uh, and then there is a gravitation, and then there is a magnetic field. And the magnetic field, you can write it as the, curl, as the divergence of the J cross P, but this term can be decomposed into magnetic tension and magnetic pressure. And the magnetic tension term, you're gonna cancel out because assuming it is isotropic, it, uh, and uh, the only term you're gonna left with is just magnetic pressure. So at the end of the day, it's exactly magnetic genes mass. Uh, it's very similar to the thermal genes mass, it's just magnetic genes mass. And, uh, you get a magnetic gene, there's a scale, so basically you just put the right-hand side equal to zero, you get a scale, and, uh, and, then, um, and then basically you integrate over the redshift to see, for example, at the given redshift, what kind of magnetic field of strength corresponds to what kind of halo mass, and uh, the result is this. So for the six of them, you get the magnetic field of strength of sub nanogauss, and the reason it is interesting is that this is where I assume if they have collapsed at redshift 10, the reason it is interesting is that all the, basically all of the current limits are above one nanogauss. They are all around a few nanogauss about the strengths of magnetic field at redshift zero. But these objects are telling us that it is actually less than that. And if you combine them, you get a trend like this which of course depends on what is the assumed collapse redshift. So if you take all these six UFDs and you just combine them, different techniques you might assume, um, and uh, all you're gonna change is that you say, okay, what is the redshift of collapse? And if you assume that these objects have collapsed at redshift 20, uh, it is gonna be, uh, uh, a, uh, a tighter constraint on the magnetic field because uh, what is happening is that a higher redshift for the same mass, a halo is more compact for a given uh, halo mass. So, and the information that you have from these ultra faint dwarfs is that you know the dynamical mass within the half light radius of these objects. So, what you do is you go there and say, you fit an FW profile and say, for what kind of halo mass can I get this much of dynamical mass within this much of uh, this radius of half-light radius? And, uh, and this is sensitive to the redshift. If you assume a higher redshift for collapse, it's gonna point to a smaller object that is collapsing. And if you allow a smaller object to collapse, this puts a tighter limit on what is the maximum magnetic field that could be present. So, I, I, when I sent this uh, result, I, some people told me that it is, it is not okay to, uh, so which is because in the previous part I showed you these, these are, each point is an upper limit by itself. And the, the error bars are the error bars on the upper limit. So this is an upper limit and an upper limit, basically. And, uh, and apparently, it is tricky to mix them, like how to combine statistics of upper limits. Um, I don't know about that subject. So all I did was like, made, wait it mean or just do some uh, uh, like uh, jackknife resampling to make sure you're not sensitive to one object. And, but it sounds like some people say that they're, they're, it is more tricky than that, like you have to be careful. I don't know what to do. If you know, please come and tell me. But so far, I think this is robust in the sense that this didn't change the results. 
So this is the first part of the talk. The second part of the talk uh, is that, so we know that there is primordial magnetic fields, and what we want to know is that what is their sources? What is their sources? And uh, so I suggested that maybe primordial black holes could be the source of magnetic fields from a small scales. And the way this one, we thought that it could work is through a process called Beerman battery. Um, so Beerman battery, you write the induction equation, and then there is this second term that always is zero, but not really always. And if you write that second term for an accretion disk around a black hole, what happens in an accretion disk is that you have a gradient in temperature, a radial gradient in temperature, but you have a vertical gradient in pressure or density. And the cross product of these two give you a toroidal field. So that toroidal field has a weird topology in the sense that since it's the cross product, the radial gradient in temperature is constant, but you have two different gradients of pressure in the upper half and lower half plane. So you get a toroidal field that is going in opposite direction depending on the, whether you're on the, which side of the mid plane. But the, but the strengths of these fields, when you do the equations, and you'll see that this kind of a scales is m to the minus 2. So if you go to lower and lower mass black holes, this, is, this battery term really dominates. And you can see the numbers are about gauss per second. And what I'm showing here is for different black holes with different spin parameter. And uh, the reason that it goes to zero at uh, a multiple of ISCO radius is that it's, uh, if you assume a thin, this thin accretion disk, you would, uh, you would see that the temperature structure of an accretion disk, although it, there's a radial gradient, but it goes up and goes to a maximum and then falls off. So that maximum that you arrive there is what causes the temperature to go to zero, and then you get a zero field, but then the field also reverses sign. So there is a four different directions happening in the upper plane. So the upper plane, even if in the upper plane, there is beyond uh, twice our east code, you're rotating in one direction, below it you're rotating in another direction, and this whole thing is reversed in the lower, lower uh, mid plane. So now, after you generate this, uh, there is an assumption, OK, you, uh, you are assuming that the fluid is not already magnetized, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but what is the key is that since this effect in, goes as an inverse MS, in, uh, m to the minus 2, the mass of the black hole, and uh, this is for a 10 solar mass primordial black hole, which is not get ruled out. Uh, um, as a potential dark matter candidate. Uh, so this could be actually interesting. There's the, these are the small C generators. And somehow, the MRI takes over, whatever it does. Then you can, after that, I don't care. So all I care is that you, there is a way, even from a non-magnetized fluid around a black hole, you get a, you get a magnetized fluid. And the rest of it could be anything. Um, so I thought these two things might be of interest to you. Uh, so I summarized that ultra fan dwarfs, at the moment, put the tightest constraint on the strength of the primordial black hole, magnetic field. And uh, maybe primordial black holes uh, could be the generator of the smallest scale seeds of the magnetic field in the universe. So. Thank you. <laughs> Questions? Glennis? Mike? Mike? I was just saying that to display my ignorance, I thought that the popular explanation for the ultra faint dwarfs was that it was a larger object who's, uh, which got stripped of, the, of, of a lot of its dark matter. Yes. And in that case, this limit wouldn't apply at all, right? Yes. So, uh, so the dark matter that they assume is being stripped uh, is one theory. There are other theories that say, 
No, no, you obviously have your own theory. I just meant to say that to use it as a limit is tough. Because of the larger cost? But this no, just is because if that were how ultra-faint dwarfs got made, then your analysis, which relies on yeah, okay. So the idea is that about the magnetic pressure. even if they formed, uh, if they formed at redshifts above twelve, and they, if they have shown that they have already made bulk of their stars at redshift above twelve, there isn't much room for you to assume that they were formed in ten to the nine solar mass. It doesn't fit any any other any theories. So those plots that they showed about the histogram of the of the uh, progenitor masses. These all point to limits about 10 to the 6 to 10 to the 7-ish for that redshift range. And it, this is irregardless of how you want to define the progenitor halo mass of an ultra-faint dwarf. This is one point. I guess I'm answering your questions in the right way. But uh, also, we are assuming within half-light radius, even if the dark matter halo has been stripped from outside, Inside, it's been intact. So when I'm fitting a profile, I'm fitting it to within a half-light radius, which I am assuming hasn't been touched. So I fit a profile with assuming a comp uh, concentration parameter. And uh, whatever the whatever it can give me any masses, and it gives me a mass that is within the range that is comparable to mass PDF at those high redshifts. Or we can talk about yeah, I may not get the line. Okay. Other questions? Okay. Thank you again. Thank you. The next speaker um, who was originally scheduled is indisposed, um, but instead we're bringing forward uh, Susan Clark's talk from the afternoon. Um, <coughs> So Susan is going to speak on modeling polarized dust emission from the three-dimensional interstellar medium. Oh, oh! however, the talk has also changed as well as the speaker. Magnetic alignment in H1 channel maps. There we go. Can you hear me? Um, but I'm Susan Clark, I'm a postdoc at the IAS, and instead I want to talk today about magnetic alignment in H1 channel maps. So specifically, I want to talk about the physical nature of, oh no. You know, you still got the slide. Okay. <laughs> of the data that we're tracing in 21 centimeter emission observations. So this is data from the GAFA H1 survey. You're panning across the sky, and you're also moving back and forth in velocity space because very fundamentally, when we make measurements of neutral hydrogen emission, we're measuring it in two dimensions of, of position and one dimension of velocity or the Doppler shifted frequency. And so the question that I want to dig into today is when we look at a narrow channel map of this emission, that is when we take our brightness temperature of H1 emission as a function of position and position and velocity, and we look at just a very thin slice in velocity space. What physically is creating the structures that we see in what we call these narrow channel maps? This question is of interest to the people in this room because it's been shown that the structures in these narrow H1 channel maps are very well aligned with the ambient magnetic field. So I showed this first in uh, starlight polarization. I wrote this machine al vision algorithm that maps spatial structure into uh, linear intensity as a function of angle. This has been mentioned earlier today. It's the rolling huff transform, or RHT. And use this to show that linear structures in these thin H1 channel maps are aligned with the magnetic field. And then once the Planck collaboration released their beautiful dust polarization data. We also showed that these linear H1 structures are very well aligned with the Planck traced uh, dust polarization magnetic field. And as you also heard this morning, if you take a spatial gradient of these same channel maps of H1 data, that is also aligned with the Planck polarization field. But 
the question is why? The question is, what are we actually seeing that's creating these aligned striations, fluctuations, structure in these narrow channel maps? What determines this magnetic alignment? And this, this comes down to the question of what is imprinting structure in our narrow channel maps? And there are two schools of thought here, basically. You heard this morning, uh, Alex Lazarian and his group discuss the picture where if you take a thin enough channel map in velocity space, the intensity structures that are imprinted are, are purely an imprint of the turbulent velocity field. And if that's the case, then measuring alignment between those structures and the magnetic field would be tracing uh, the velocity magnetic field alignment that, for example, is predicted in theories of MHG turbulence. Instead, it's possible that those structures are actual three-dimensional density structures that exist in the ISM, in which case we would be tracing an alignment between density structures and the magnetic field. So how can we discriminate between these pictures? Well, we have at our disposal observations that are sensitive only to the density field and not also to the velocity field. So for example, broadband FIR observations like the 857 gigahertz channel of the Planck dust emission or the H1 column density. So the, this H1 brightness temperature integrated over 200 kilometers per second along the line of sight. Both of these trace only a density field and are not sensitive to any velocity information. So one thing we can do to test whether structures in narrow H1 channel maps are density structures is to measure the correlation with these density tracers, with the FIR dust emission on the left and with the H1 column density on the right. So one simple way to measure this correlation is just to stack on the locations of structures in thin H1 velocity channels. And when you do this stacking experiment, you see very clearly that there's a correlation between these linear magnetically aligned structures in the channel maps and the density field. So these are, these are density structures, three-dimensional structures in space. So here I'm stacking on this RHT algorithm applied to a narrow channel map, but we can generalize this further. We can instead just take our narrow channel map, this one is integrated only over two kilometers per second, and just take an unsharp mask of that channel map. So just a simple high pass filter to highlight the small scale spatial structure. And then we can stack our density tracers on that. And again, you see a clear correlation between the 857 gigahertz dust emission and the structures that you see in these narrow channel maps. You see the same thing in the H1 column density. So the, what is physically imprinting the fluctuations in these channel maps are actual density structures. They are correlated with the tracers that only trace the density field in the ISM. But we can look for an effect of velocity fluctuations in our data uh, because there's a very specific prediction that's put forward uh, that was nicely summarized by Alex this morning. Uh, this goes back to work by Lazarian and Pugosian in 2000 and a series of papers around then. And that is that you should see an increasing contribution to the intensity in a narrow channel map when you make that channel map narrower and narrower in velocity space. And so here I'm going to measure a, another simple metric for the correlation between narrow H1 velocity channel structures and the density field. This, this could not be simpler. I'm just going to take a, a weighted mean. I'm going to take the FIR emission weighted by the unsharp mask of my narrow velocity channel. And then I'm just going to subtract the unweighted mean of the FIR emission. So that's going to be this delta I857. And in the limit where the structures in the H1 channel are uncorrelated with the density field, in the limit that they are pure velocity fluctuations, this I857, delta I857 should go to zero. So I'm going to put a, a suggestive 
trend here just to remind you of the expected drop-off, and I'm going to have it get to zero uh, around this channel width that was used uh, in my work on magnetic alignment in H1 and also in uh, the Lazarian papers that use H1 channel maps. So what do I find in the data? In fact, there is a clear correlation between structures in these narrow channel maps and the dust emission across the full range of velocity widths that we measure. And in fact, the density fluctuations are dominating these channel maps, even for the narrowest velocity channels that we're able to measure. There's a small dip here. We go down here to the, to the Galfa velocity resolution of 0.18 kilometers per second. So smaller than the narrowest thermal line width you could expect in the ISM. And that small dip is consistent with an increase in noise in our very, very narrowest channels. We can see this another way. We can go back to our stacking experiment and do the same thing. Look for the correlation as a function of velocity. Again, no matter how you want to measure this correlation, the density fluctuations are the dominant contribution to the emission structure in H1 channel maps, no matter how thinly you slice them. And so H1 channel maps are density dominated. And the alignment that we're measuring between structures in these narrow channel maps and the magnetic field is fundamentally an alignment between three-dimensional structures in the ISM and the ambient magnetic field. Now, I want to just very briefly comment, this is the only slide I will show you that is simulations instead of data, uh, on why we might not expect prominent contributions from uncorrelated velocity fluctuations in the ISM. Here I'm showing you just simple isothermal turbulence simulations on the top. I'm taking a narrow channel map slice through the simulation. And on the bottom, I'm showing you the integrated intensity over the full length of the simulation, so the column density of the simulation. On the right, you see a, a supersonic, sonic Mach number of five simulation, and you see structures in the narrow channel map that are very well correlated with structures in the column density. Now, this is a supersonic flow, and so the density and velocity fields are very well correlated. The structures that you see here are correlated with each other dynamically because the flow is supersonic. In a subsonic flow, like you see on the left, the velocity and density fields are not well correlated. But, by definition, of course, subsonic flows have a thermal line width that is much larger than the turbulent line width. And so here, your narrow channel map is very well correlated with the column density map thermodynamically. The thermal broadening smooths out the velocity fluctuations that you could have in a channel map and instead makes it so that each of your channel maps is very well correlated with the total column. So what do I think physically is actually responsible for the magnetic alignment of structures in these narrow channel maps? Well, we can do a different experiment and investigate the physical properties of small-scale structures in these narrow channel maps. So here, I'm taking my unsharp mask of the channel map, and I'm binning my data by the intensity in the unsharp mask. So as you go from yellow to purple here, you're looking at smaller and smaller scale structures in a thin channel map of H1. And then I'm plotting the histogram at the locations of these channel map structures of the ratio of the 857 gigahertz FIR emission to the H1 column density. And what you see is that as we move toward these smaller scale structures in the channel map, this histogram shifts upward, shifts to the right. So zeroth order, this is again showing that the, the structures, small scale structures in these channel maps are compositionally different from their surrounding medium. Again, they are density structures, but this is also suggestive that these structures are preferentially CNN that have a higher FIR to NH1 ratio than warmer structures in the H1 gas. And this is being tested by Claire Murray, who is an expert in absorption line spectroscopy, uh, and she's finding agreement by measuring FCNM directly 
uh, in this data with a picture where small scale structures in narrow channel maps are preferentially CNM phase H1 material that is more anisotropic than the surrounding more diffuse WNM medium. And these anisotropic CNM structures are preferentially aligned with the ambient magnetic field. I think there is support for this picture from uh, various disparate observations of the ISM. You can make line width measurements by doing on-off experiments with particular features in the H1. I will also very suggestively put up this cloud measured in H1 absorption by Naomi McClure Griffiths back in 2006, where you see strands of very cold, very magnetically aligned H1 absorption features. And so I, I, I think this picture is all coming together. And uh, to, to summarize the complete picture, Structures that we see in narrow velocity channels of H1 are dust-bearing density structures. They are not an imprint of the turbulent velocity field. They are not what is referred to in the literature sometimes as velocity caustics. If you take a gradient of one of these H1 channel maps, spatial gradient, you will measure something that is aligned, well, aligned perpendicular to the magnetic field, not because you're measuring a signature of the turbulent velocity gradient, but because you're measuring the orientation of magnetically aligned CNM structures in the ISM. And this is consistent with a picture of the ISM in which the cold H1 gas is preferentially organized into small scale anisotropic structures that are elongated along the direction of the local magnetic field. Thank you. Question. Oh, hello. How are you? Yeah, there. It's on now. Yeah, you push it in again. I there, now leave it alone. few things that I would like to comment before I we have some you know, agreement or disagreement, whether gradients are tracing structures or what. First thing would be, um, actually, when you are saying something, you know, some density structures are uh, elongated along the magnetic field directions, you have to specify the physical conditions. For instance, if you are in the case of subalvanic, subsonic turbulence, the cases will be completely different with supersonic, superalvanic turbulence. This, this is observational data. I know, but you have, to a you have to work on your thing based on theory. No, we can observe anything from the sky. For instance, we have a group member that can create a very well aligned map. And then we can say, oh, the, the magnetic field is traced by the magnet. But we have to check it with theory and also numerical simulations. Alex developed his, I'm sorry, I can. I have bad hearing. I have bad hearing, so it just She's matter. asking whether you found anything wrong with these observations, or oh. is it just that they disagree with your theory? I, I would say in this way. First of all, uh, Alex's theory in 2000 is not talking about pure velocity acoustics. In his theory, he's actually uh, separating density and velocity contribution in this yes, paper. Yes, I agree. And he's not, he's not trying to negate the density contribution in his previous papers. Even for his later contribution in 2004, 2006, 2012, and 2016, he's actually making different comments on densities and velocities. Let me be clear. The prediction that this I mean, so this is actually you're putting with. words in our mouth that we are saying pure Excuse velocity acoustics. The, the prediction that this data disagrees with is the statement that narrow velocity channels of H1 emission are dominated by an imprint of the turbulent velocity. Field. How thin do you want? As you saw, we went down to the resolution limit of the Arecibo survey, which is 0.18 kilometers per second. What is your turbulent velocity? Well, it. In the CNM, the turbulent line width is a few kilometers per second. 
Yeah, let them. Let, I mean, less. So Alex, this, do you want to say this something? This spans the range of everything that you've looked at. Yes. Any? Okay. Okay, it's interesting. Uh, it's, uh, um, uh, you know, I don't want to argue uh, against uh, anything before I really studied it. It's, uh, it does not change anything in terms of what I was telling in terms of um, the um, turbulence. This is, uh, if these are de really density structures, they are uh, nevertheless produced by turbulence. And we see for um, um, the, mm, uh, uh, at least uh, low Mach number alignment of uh, the uh, density structures that are produced and uh, uh, the, uh, the uh, magnetic field. It is surprising to me uh, in terms of uh, uh, the, uh, from the spectral point of view. In uh, the case uh, that uh, you have density dominated uh, structures, we should uh, have uh, the uh, shallow spectrum in thin channels, but we don't. So there is uh, some inconsistency, some uh, problem. Uh, it is uh, uh, thin channels are dominated by density when you have uh, the power spectral index uh, uh, more shallow than minus three, three-dimensional uh, three. And uh, we do not see this. It's interesting to understand uh, how this can be reconciled. And again, I would uh, avoid uh, uh, discussing uh, this before I uh, studied uh, the Results. I think the phase structure of the ISM is extremely important to consider. No, no, here. this is where we are talking about the statistics. Alex? Statistic does not depend whether we have two structure. other questions. Mm -hmm. uh, Glennis and then Lakesley. Uh, Button. Button. I wondered if you could give us help in imagining how the uh, alignment works. Are they like long pencils lined along the uh, magnetic field, or? I mean. <laughs> they are extremely thin, uh, spatially thin structures, in addition to being cold and so having narrow thermal linelets. Um, I think the, the best thing to do is honestly just to look at the data. Um, this, uh, this movie is one way to visualize this data. The, the red, green, and blue here are three different velocity channels along the line of sight, and which three are selected is moving back and forth. And so here, especially when you are off the plane in the more diffuse ISM, you see very prominent linear narrow structures. This is why we originally, when we were looking into alignment with the magnetic field, went after something that parameterized the linearity in the medium. Um, Right, so if you put this gas at a distance of 100 parsecs, we're looking at high latitude gas, so uh, of course we don't know the distance well. Um, but if you do that, then the physical resolution of this data is 0.12 parsecs, so, yeah. Lakesley. I just, I wanna understand, so you didn't actually take the H1 channel maps yes. as a function of their thickness, you, you modified it by the FIR Map. No. Could could you? These are H1 channel maps as a function. In terms of, of the thickness. spectral index, like that, sorry, that plot. Right. So the x axis here, oops, put the data on. Uh -huh. uh, the x axis here is the width of the channel map of H1. Right. Okay. And so in each of these channel maps of varying width, I take the unsharp mask, the high spatial frequency structures in that channel map data. And then I simply measure this weighted mean minus unweighted mean. Oh my goodness. I'm yeah. sorry, could you bring back that plot? Stand by. Stand by. Um, Technical I'm difficulty. just measuring the correlation between the structures in the narrow channel map and the FIR. Right, and actually I didn't understand. The FIR just looks like a blob. What am I, 
Oh, in the what stacked? What am I missing? In yeah. the stacked data? Yeah, sorry. So that, I didn't see any correlation. That's the correlation function between oh, the okay. channel map structures. And the, yeah. Do you have the FIR maps, like, paired just spatially with I the H1? I do. I have all sorts of bonus slides. Um, well, oh, I guess you can working. see it over here. Here's just one little section just to illustrate. Um, You're back up on the Hooray. Uh, this is an image of the 857 gigahertz data from Planck and uh, three velocity channels of the H1 highlighted there by their color. OK. Thank you again. Thank you. Our next talk will be by Rocio Kaiman. From, and the title is Finding Age Relations for Low Mass Stars Using Magnetic Activity and Kinematics. Hello. Is this working fine? Yes. Um, OK, so I'm going to take a different focus of what we've been hearing. And I'm going to discuss um, a different use of the magnetic fields in low mass stars in particular. Uh, so again, my name is Rocio Kiman, and I'm working with uh, my advisor, Kelly Cruz, and in collaboration with Ruth Angus, Sarah Smith, uh, Jackie Fierty, and Emily Rice. So we are studying MDORs. Um, MDORs are a type of low mass stars that are very faint, and they have a lifetime or about the time of the universe. So we have a, a big range of ages when we are studying low mass stars. So why we want them dwarfs? They are also the most common star in the galaxy in number and in mass. So if, for example, we want to study the evolution of the galaxy and we have a big sample of dwarfs, we can use them to study how the galaxy, for example, forms. Also, they are the major targets in, select, um, in search for Earth-like planets, meaning if you want to find an Earth-like planet, they most likely are going to be around an M-dwarf. But studying m dwarfs is not that easy. When you go to earlier types and higher masses, the star's interior have, a, like the sun, a radiative core and a convective envelope. But when you go to later types or lower masses, they become fully convective. And we don't fully understand how they work. And we don't have models at work. So my work is um, we, are, we are concentrating on getting the ages of the stars. So for example, if we want to study solar type stars, uh, we could use something like gyrochronology or isogram fittings, different models. But when we go to convective stars, we don't know. So if we want to get ages for stars, we need to use empirical and statistical age relations. And that's what I'm going to talk about today. So although we cannot measure an age directly from, a, from an M-dwarf or using models, we do know about several age indicators that will tell us more or less if a star is young or old. One of them is rotation periods. We know that. When a star is young, they rotate fast, and when they get older, they start slowing down. This is a direct measurement, and we can, with uh, surveys such as Kepler, Kepler-2, and tests, we are being able to get a big sample of rotation periods. Uh, this, uh, so I mentioned that it's correlated with age, and this is uh, related to the magnetic fields that generates, in part, uh, the solar winds that takes away the angular momentum and the star slows down as they age. Another age indicator is magnetic activity. So we know when a star is young, they are more active than they, they are older. This measurement is not direct. Uh, especially for MDOS, it's very difficult to measure directly the magnetic field. So we need to use a proxies for the magnetic field. So we know the magnetic field heat the corona and the chromosphere. And this emits H alpha lines, X-ray, and UV. And these are things that we can measure. Um, we also know that the, <coughs> that the magnetic activity is tightly correlated to rotation, especially because, uh, as I mentioned before, uh, the two, we, we think that the magnetic activity is generated by the layer that is between the, uh, 
radiative core and the convective envelope that generates a dynamo that is, is responsible for the magnetic field. But if you go to the fully convective stars, that layer is not there anymore. But we still see signs of magnetic activity in fully convective stars, such as in the work of Newton et al. 2017, where she showed the relation between luminosity of H-alpha in the y-axis and rotation periods uh, or Rossby number in the x-axis, showing how for the saturation limit for uh, fast rotator stars and the power law for slow rotator stars and how the H-alpha decreases with those. The third uh, H indicator I'm going to talk about is 3D kinematics. So we know that when a star, or we think we, uh, when a star is young and it's born and moves close to the plane of the galaxy, and as they grow older, they interact with other stars on, with, or with molecular clouds, and they get separated from the plane of the galaxy. So if you grab like a group of stars at its all and measure the dispersion, for example, if you measure the vertical velocity and you measure the dispersion, the dispersion should be higher than if you measure the dispersion of a, a young group of stars. These are also direct measurements, and we can measure a vertical action dispersion, vertical velocity dispersion, and tangential velocity. So as I mentioned before, the goal of my project is to measure ages of M dwarfs. Uh, so the first step was to put together the sample with all the age indicators that we need. We started with a sample of 74,216 M and L dwarfs from the Sloan Digital Sky Survey, which has low resolution spectra. And um, from two works, West 2011 and Schmidt 2015, we compiled all the stars that had H alpha measurements equivalent with variable velocities and spectral types. We also cross-matched this sample with the later release, the Gaia DR2, to get parallaxes and proper motions. We found that 90% of the sample was in Gaia, so this is very promising. Um, so later, we cross-matched with Rosat for X-ray. We found around 800 stars. Galax for UV, we found 900 stars, approximately. And we are going to get rotation free periods from K2, but that is in the future. So the idea is to combine all these H indicators to infer an H probability distribution for each one of the stars and the parameters of the models that relates the H with the observables. But today I'm going to concentrate in particular in the cross match between SESS and Gaia. So relating to what I was saying before, I have H alpha as an H indicator and 3D kinematics. This is uh, how the sample looks like. I'm comparing the sample to the 100 parsec sample from Gaia DR2. So we can, this is, a, well, the color magnitude diagram, absolute magnitude in the y-axis, and Gaia color in the x-axis. We can see the, the beginning of the red chain branch. Remember that this is only a 100 parsec sample. The white dwarfs, and on the end of the main sequence, M and L dwarfs, uh, where we would expect them to be. So if I select all the stars that are inactive, I mentioned that we have H alpha equivalent width for, uh, from which we can distinguish a method to separate them in inactive and active. So this is the same color magnitude diagram showing only the active, uh, inactive stars. And if I plot on top of it the active stars with the color code of the luminosity of H alpha uh, in the logarithm, we, where yellow is high magnetic activity and black is low magnetic activity, we can see that for earlier types or higher masses, the active stars follow uh, are above the main sequence. Uh, so this is saying that we have active stars that are bright, which means that they are young. Uh, but if we, we try to compare this with isochrons or other models, we see that the stars that are way above the main sequence, they should be very young to actually have that position. They should have like 10 million years. And we don't have that type of stars that ages in our sample. So what, what we think is going on here is that they are inflated due to their high magnetic activity. So using Gaia and SDSS, we were able to identify young stars and maybe some of them are magnetically inflated. 
Uh, so I mentioned we have two H indicators, um, 3D kinematics and magnetic activity. Uh, in this plot, I'm showing them together, so they should be correlated. Um, we have H alpha on the y-axis divided in active and inactive stars and vertical action dispersion in the y-axis. So what we are seeing here is that stars that have low magnetic activity and high vertical action dispersion are, uh, so the stars that, sorry, that stars that have low magnetic activity have high vertical action dispersion, meaning they are old stars. And the same for active stars which have low vertical action dispersion. So we can actually see that the two H indicators that we were looking at are actually correlated. So the next step of the project is to put everything together into a Bayesian analysis. Um, so what we started doing was to use a, a simulated sample of 10 stars. Uh, we randomly assigned ages for these stars and calculated the observables of H alpha and vertical action, imagining that we know a model for that relation calculated those observables, and then put those observables into a Bayesian algorithm to recover the ages that we assign it. And we can see here that we have the true age in the x-axis and the inferred age in the y-axis, that between the one sigma we've been able to recover, even in this very simple model, the ages that we assign. So the idea, the next uh, step is to actually use all the age indicators into the Bayesian analysis to recover the ages for the answers. So a very quick summary, um, we combine magnetic activity and vertical action dispersion to, uh, inf we wanna infer ages of low mass stars. We could identify young and, uh, and or inflated M dwarfs using absolute magnitudes from Gaia DR2 and equivalent width from SDSS and we were able to find an age velocity trend with vertical action and dispersion versus H alpha. So in the future, and in the future we wanna infer age priority distributions functions for each one of the stars. Thank you for your attention. Any questions? Seat okay. night, please. Stephanie. Um, okay. Uh, so, so this is not my field. Um, so decreased um, magnetic activity uh, is also, I think, found for older stars at high masses. Um, is there any uh, like relation between kind of the age versus magnetic activity relation in low mass stars and high mass stars? Does magnetic activity you know, fade faster with age or slower with age, um, dependent on mass? And well, why might that be? Um, so we don't know why, but what we know is that for higher mass <coughs> M dwarfs, um, they are active when they're old and they suddenly lose their activity. And when you go to lower masses, they stay active longer uh, in their lifetime. So if, if you look oh, here, you can see how you have a bunch of inactive stars for the early ones. And when you go to the later, they are all mostly active. That's because you, if you find like a low mass M dwarf, they are probably gonna be active. So when you are looking at the low mass M dwarf or an M8, if you, they are active, it doesn't mean they are young, mostly. They could be old and have activity. Okay. Thank you. Likes so This is really nice work. I'm Thank wondering, because you. you motivated this with uh, Earth-like planets at the start of your talk. Yeah. Does this active and inactive states have any relationship to habitability or the odds of finding Earth-like planets? Is there, is there any relation between the magnetic field activity and, and possible implications for planets around these stars? Well, so uh, one thing that you could do is to relate 
the activity of the star with the presence of an exoplanet. Definitely, you could study the properties of the star that it's actually hosting planets. And for sure, the, studying the magnetic activity of an m is fundamental to understand the habitability of the exoplanets around it, and if how the environment is going to be affected by the magnetic activity of the m -dors. Yes, definitely. OK. Thank you again. And I think we're now going to move to a discussion. Uh, Michael Unger is going to lead it. Okay. Two. Okay, so let's quickly, um, in 20 minutes, discuss a few interesting points, or at least the ones I found interesting. So the the session was a pretty mixed bag. So we had this uh, this this cluster of uh, discussion on the gradient methods. Also, this is related. Um, so let's go through first what, what I, found, I, found, bleh, I found interesting and then go to a general discussion. Okay. Uh, so regarding the first talk, so we've seen that we can now make very nice uh, simulations of galaxies, including the magnetic fields. Uh, so what I'm wondering here, and we had this discussion about helicity, uh, conservation, whatever. So what is the detail of these uh, simulations? and can we really trust what comes out of it? And for instance, this is one paper from Pacmore et al, where they're making the point, if you take one of these simulated galaxies and you put the observer at different azimuthal places uh, at eight kiloparsec, you see all kinds of structures, and this is what we see here uh, in the Milky Way. But if you now interpreted this as a, as a coherent field, you would probably be misled a lot. So I don't know if someone in the audience has a feeling if, if yeah, well, should we take this serious? And in this case, the uh, rotation measures that we measure at Earth are kind of just a random coincidence. Or is the quality of these uh, simulations not good enough? Well, isn't it true that you're sampling a at least somewhat coherent field in the simulation at different points? Right. So I'm not sure why interpreting the Milky Way values as structure of a coherent field is problematic. These are all samples of a coherent field, all nine of them. Well, so, but, but there's like a general consensus that this uh, pattern in the Milky Way uh, gives you uh, something, a hint of, this, of a toroidal structure of the field, which I guess in this simulation is not present. Yeah? So you didn't, in this oh, simulation, no, 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 if, no, no, if you're sitting here Well, and I should let, yeah. is Mark here? Oh, there he is. Yeah. Do you want to comment? I'm not uh, particularly involved in that work, but I, I should just a general comment is um, that of course the, the and we had a discussion about this over the coffee break that there is some dependence of what you predict for these magnetic fields in terms of the feedback that you put in. Right? There's a there's a certain feedback realization in this model in terms of how the ISM is treated, how the stellar feedback is done, how the winds are generated, and all this will to some degree affect uh, the magnetic field structure and magnetic field strength. So and you know, the, the amount of studies that we have numerically in galaxy formation to <coughs> predict these magnetic fields is very limited. This is just one incarnation, and there's not much more beyond that at that level of resolution and with that level of detail. So I think it would be very interesting to see, uh, you know, from other groups with other feedback prescriptions how, how the details of the magnetic fields actually vary. Because we know that the feedback, the cooling, and all this plays a huge role in what we discussed in, in terms of the amplification and so on. So that, there's for sure a strong dependence. So I, I would not argue that that is the unique answer that comes right. out of all these galaxy formation simulations if they would add magnetic fields. Yes. Just generalize it, though. Pretty much any disk galaxy is going to have a toroidal, a large toroidal component in any of these models with any feedback mechanism. But they don't. In oh, but, the but if you look at this, so like you don't see this uh, strikingly in the rotation measures. If this was your place in, in the galaxy, you would not conclude that, right? So my, my understanding is that the, these, these kind of uh, more or less random features pre prevent, uh, if, if, if this was, was a true representation of a galaxy, you would conclude that uh, our observation is, is nothing we should be too excited about because you have all these foregrounds. Maybe there's a comment? Yeah, I have a question about the magnetic field treatment in the simulation, so this might be a question for Philip. Um, and Mark. Uh, so 
uh, I'm curious about the difference between like the constrained transport and the divergence cleaning schemes, because um, that definitely would affect something like a dynamo. And so, uh, could you guys comment maybe on on the illustrious TNG, which I think uses the divergence cleaning? And is there any plan in the future to use um, a constrained transport scheme like what Philip has developed? The point is TNG, also these simulations, they use a, a cleaning scheme, right? That is what all these simulations. Sorry, what does, what does cleaning scheme mean? <laughs> well, it's typically a Powell, uh, Powell 8 wave cleaning scheme that is used. So the um, so by construction, the, the divergence of the B field is not kept. Mm -hmm. zero. Ah, okay. So it's okay. Clean, like a Daytona scheme mm -hmm. or a Powell scheme. So that is used. There. That means if you if you make a plot or if you if you look at the divergence of B, there are non-zero with B values in the simulation. But typically, they are controlled uh, to a very small amount. Um, so they are diffused out, so they, they don't usually play a role. And my understanding is, so so Philip can come on this, if you do a constrained transport, that for many, again, Philip is the expert, for many properties, things look very similar if you do constrained transport. But the point is we have never run any of these large cosmological or zoom-in simulations with a constrained transport in with this specific code. So maybe Philip can. Philip. Um, these cosmological boxes, there's no large difference in the magnetic field amplification um, between the two schemes. And we use the Powell scheme because that's the one that's working for the hierarchical time stepping that we have in the code. But there are differences on, on higher resolution uh, simulations where you're actually resolving the small scale dynamo action, maybe an individual a galaxy with hundreds of thousands of resolution elements. But that's not the simulations here. All right. So thanks for that. Uh, yeah. Uh, sorry, but sure. I mean, there were, so Rüdiger and, and Volker and others have, have done an enormous amount of tests uh, to make sure that this, uh, not that the cleaning scheme doesn't in introduce any artificial effects, so the growth of the magnetic field and so on. They studied this in a lot of situations. I would actually trust that the magnetic field treatment is is reliable. So now, why we don't see this toroidal component in these things, I'm, I'm not sure about, but I think the actual treatment of the magnetic field should be numerically reliable. Are in these you simulations. actually sure that you're not seeing a toroidal field? Well, we, I, I haven't checked this myself, so I don't, yeah, I don't know. There's a comment over there. Yeah, sorry. Can we also oh. trust Mike. Uh -huh. Good point. No I don't even know where they're coming from. Um, Are you making, you have OB stars there? You know. And, uh, well, okay, this, this, this is much, this is done much more simplistic in this simulation, but there's no. This no is Auriga or, or yeah, yeah, also, no, also so Just generally speaking, yeah. this is true for the large scales I showed and, and, and these ones. So they are. There are no individual stars, right? There's there's a mm -hmm. average macroscopic stellar particle which has a 10 to the 4 or 10 to the 3 solar masses, and the, these are IMF averaged particles. So of, there is a there's an energy budget and a mass budget that comes, of course, also from all kinds of stars. Um, but in terms of electrons and so on, the, the, there's also no um, detailed transport for these electrons or whatever. This is just much more simplistic, right? Yeah. This is not. Included in this Are you just assuming that everything is ionized or <laughs> anything more? <coughs> so, what do you mean? In the gas or what? So, Faraday rotation requires. Yeah, no, I mean, you, you, have, a, you have a certain a certain temperature in, in, in the gas. You're and the collisional ionization. Yeah, yeah, yes. Okay. Yeah. Well, there is a photo ionization that comes as well, but this is not the same thing. Yeah. Okay. Right. Okay, and then let's go to this, this uh, big. Uh, block of, of talks we had. So for me, I heard this the first time uh, in that detail, and, and in the morning session, this was seemed to be too good to be true. I know this is like a, a free lunch measurement of, of the whole thing. So as you might have learned from yesterday, I'm using Faraday rotation and synchrotron. So I just throw all this away and then and, and, and switch to this. So I would be interested, what is the limitations? What are the systematic theoretical biases? What are the range? How far can we look? And then what Susan's talk. So I, I understood that you were challenging the theoretical basis, basically, but then you still have this correlation. So like, 
is your observation basically nullifying this or so because there was a very diplomatic discussion but i didn't really understand so so please uh, tell me um okay. structures in narrow h1 channel maps are very well aligned and i can see that you've been doing this for years the point that i was making in my talk is that they are not aligned because the structures that we see are an imprint of the turbulent velocity field, meaning that what we're measuring is not the alignment between the velocity gradient and the magnetic field that's predicted by MHG turbulence. But then if it's, I'm just interested in the magnetic field, I don't care, right, where it comes from. That's right, although <laughs> you're, you're going to care because in, in MHG turbulence, the alignment between the velocity field and the magnetic field is very clean, mm -hmm. and, so, and so some of the statements presented were that this uh, will will work cleanly, simply, and everywhere because it's it's measuring this fundamental correlation in MHG turbulence. Instead, <laughs> we need to understand what we're actually seeing in the observations, which involve unavoidably the phase structure of the IFM and the density magnetic field alignment, which is what is actually measured in these channel maps, is more complicated in MHG turbulence than the velocity magnetic field alignment. Okay, there's a comment over there as to be expected. <laughs> So sorry, you don't hear too much from me today. I have called, so I, you could see uh, I was not interfering much with this. Um, uh, well, uh, in a sense, uh, the uh, difference, uh, me and Susan, is uh, the nature of uh, the structures. And indeed, if there is uh, um, this uh, structures in H1, um, uh, which uh, I uh, indeed uh, uh, contributing to that. It's an interesting uh, uh, discovery, I would say, that uh, there are this indeed, uh, uh, most of the structures is uh, filamentary. This is uh, fine, and uh, this is, in fact, corresponds to whatever Xiao was uh, giving us earlier. This, from the practical point of view, it does not change anything. And uh, we suggested this uh, technique based on uh, um, <coughs> gradients in the uh, channel maps. And we developed a technique which makes uh, it uh, this uh, gradients in the channel maps, whatever its nature. Um, uh, we showed uh, that they correlate well with uh, magnetic fields. What we know from uh, observation, uh, no, from uh, numerical simulations, we know from numerical simulations uh, that we do not need to face media to have uh, this uh, uh, correlations, to have these gradients, and to be able to study. Therefore, uh, there is no limitations uh, which are arising from uh, um, uh, the fact that uh, there could be this uh, uh, density uh, structure. So from practical point of view, it's working. I would claim at least uh, uh, our, similar, um, our analysis shows that uh, the uh, alignment measures of the uh, gradients in the channel maps uh, is uh, better than uh, the um, um, uh, filaments identified by uh, uh, the other technique that Susan advocates. This is interesting to see uh, how it works, but what is also important that this uh, technique works not only for uh, H1. It works also for molecular clouds, and uh, this was uh, tested, and we saw this comparison with the Planck data, with um, uh, uh, blast pulp data, and uh, it also um, works well in uh, uh, numerical simulations with uh, self-adsorption. Mm -hmm. So in terms of the technique, we are uh, sound. 
there is an interesting uh, issue whether uh, indeed uh, H1 is mostly filamentary. There are some uh, things that I need to digest. I need to study Susan's results. Right. And uh, these are important uh, physical uh, you know, entities which are introducing uh, this uh, fluctuation to the channel maps in uh, um, um, the uh, particular observations. It is, again, uh, I would stress that uh, our technique also works for molecular class, from which we tried also to apply, to, uh, the, to apply this uh, uh, Susan technique, and it was not working. Mm, OK. But then may maybe, so if, 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 if you know, you showed this nice scan, or maybe you, you can answer. The, uh, so uh, along this plane, you're giving me basically the strength and, and the field. So if I was pressing you, how precise do you know this? What but, is like because uh, like if you, if you the, interpret there's always a drawback somewhere below, and maybe you didn't tell me. So, <laughs> so what well, are, what are the the, the answer? There, there, there? Are, there are many things so that uh, I can. So let's say this is three microgauss. Plus uh, minus yeah, what? Yeah, yeah. Uh, oh, <laughs> we uh, have a discussion of this in this uh, paper of you. The, this is not in uh, this particular plot. Mm -hmm. Uh, this uh, plot was done uh, not to find uh, uh, this uh, uh, intensity, so it was this illustration, mm -hmm. but it was uh, find this uh, um, uh, polarization of the stars. And uh, the other uh, Up here, plot, you say, yes, this yes, one. Yes. Yeah. We this predicted uh, this uh, three-dimensional structure, and we used it to uh, uh, predict the polarization for uh, uh, the stars, and we compared right, and then you get like twenty-five percent the the yellow, right? Yeah. Some and blue there stuff. Also some so the particular hmm. stars, which uh, they have, uh, you know, negative alignment, mm -hmm. which um, is uh, also interesting uh, case, and uh, um, we attribute it to the superalphanic turbulence hmm. because uh, the uh, <coughs> gradients are. Uh, uh, additive in a different way from uh, the uh, uh, Stokes parameters. And okay, if I can stop you here because we have some more uh, <laughs> people want to ask, speak out. Um, Blakely and yeah? Philip to comment on. Oh, Blakely had her hand up. So actually, I, my question was to ask you and Philip to comment because you guys had what looked like a pretty compelling picture to me about how shocks form and so on, and it was, seems quite contrary to the one that uh, Alex has promoted. And so I'm maybe... I think not contrary. My understanding um, is that the alignment changes when you have shocks, right? So that's what Alex and uh, his collaborators were showing. So uh, what Philip and I were s was, was studying was specifically how the magnetic field and the shock morphology um, interact. Uh, so it's, it's in some sense it's... Uh, I I don't know what these what these filaments are made by, but certainly you can have filament formation by shocks. That's that's absolutely true. And what Alex has shown is that you actually should be able to trace shocks and or self gravitating regions when you have these strong density enhancements. Um, I actually wanted to share. Maybe maybe Philip wants to comment on that as well. But I wanted to share something actually from the last point, if I may, because we have a a big following on the streaming, and so we had mm -hmm. some contributions from Reiner Beck, so maybe yeah. now or, what, or what later. Year? Or it was from the, the uh, large-scale simulations. The simulations, okay. Yeah, yeah so Reiner Beck, um, he wanted to make two comments on these simulations. One, uh, their resolution is not sufficient to excite a large-scale dynamo, so that there is no surprise they do not obtain large-scale fields. And the other point, not all external galaxies have strong toroidal fields. In many cases, the large-scale field is weaker than the local still one to two kiloparsec size structures. Hmm. That's, that's a comment from Reiner. Okay. Thank you, Reiner. Thanks, yeah. <laughs> okay, so then we have two minutes. Maybe I would like to cover one more thing, because unfortunately we had this, uh, we did not talk about this because the talk was canceled. So we talk about very small structures, about galactic structures, but not about the intergalactic magnetic fields. Yeah? And so here you see this really, or several orders of magnitudes, the exclusion plots, and here's the coherence length. So this is, where the intergalactic magnetic field is. Obviously, it's very important for us cosmic ray physicists. So I don't know what we were supposed to hear today from the fast radio bursts, but the, uh, so the, the question to you is, 
what do you think, is there any chance we can get a little bit more? Uh, because simulations that we have, so the one simulation had a 10 nanogauss, yeah, which is, which is uh, already sitting. Those 10 nanogauss would be here, yeah? So that's, what, so that, that's why I, I, I asked you um, before, what does 10 nanogauss refer to? No, you don't listen. So um, anyway, so simulations are somewhere, it seems very close to this upper limit. Um, so my question to both simulators and to observers, if we can have any progress cons constraining this one. Dead silence, that's a no. <laughs> okay. Um, well, then we are, we are basically uh, for lunch, so then I just want to again make the point that Noemi made already, so that maybe we're seeing now the, the dawn of outer energy causing ray you, uh, as a tool to make galactic magnetic field tomography. This is the, the view that Auger had, so that's similar to what, what, what Noemi said, yeah? that the large scale distribution where the cosmic rays maybe come from uh, could be deflected in the galactic magnetic field. So the cool thing about these cosmic rays would be that you would, like, like the synchrotron, you would get a measure of the perpendicular magnetic field, but you don't need to know the cosmic ray electrons. And so there would be a very direct measure, uh, again, along the line of sight. So just to make sure that you keep this on your radar. Okay, I think it's lunchtime. <laughs>